there's a big holiday coming up. You guys are probably aware because you have maybe relatives coming into town or lots of guests or you're trying to figure out how you're going to cook a turkey without drying it out. And that holiday is Thanksgiving. Now, I don't know what Thanksgiving looks like for you, but for my family, Thanksgiving was a big event. We had about 40 to 50 people when I was a kid at my house. We were camped out on the floor on air mattresses and uh, having the time of our lives. And, and when you get that many people for Thanksgiving, fun stuff happens. You end up with some funny stories. Uh, one time, one of our wonderful guests decided to take up the hobby of wood carving uh, with their fork into my mother's fine mahogany dining room table. Um, and we didn't notice until halfway through dinner that they had carved some beautiful artwork gouging out slivers of this very expensive table, and those gouges are still there to this day. Another time, we were playing Frisbee very competitively, and I ended up, uh, my full, you know, small self, ended up falling bodily upon my mother uh, while chasing the Frisbee, dislocating her shoulder, uh, tearing numerous tendons and ligands and other ligaments and other things that aren't meant to be separated, and sending her for a Thanksgiving hospital visit. So um, that was exciting. Another time, my uh, absent-minded but wonderful father, thinking I'm sure about my mom's injury and hospital visit, uh, left a Tupperware full of cookies in the oven. Another person fired the oven up to 425 degrees, unaware that there were these toxic plastics just waiting to be melted down. We didn't notice until the toxic fumes had well permeated the house and smelled super weird. We had to open the doors, air everything out for a little bit. It was, it was exciting. It was exciting and probably explains a lot today about myself. But what's amazing about family is that once the dust settles, once you get rid of the extended relations, once, once, once the house is quiet and the toxic fumes are aired into the atmosphere, they're still my family. Even after all of that, they're still my family. There's something deep, something biological that, that binds us together that's deeper than any political opinion, that's deeper than anything else in the world. And what I'm here to remind you of this morning is that you have your biological family but as a Christian, you have another family. You have a bigger family. Even if your biological family is unspeakably horrible, some chuckled, some went, uh-oh. Um, some said, am I allowed to chuckle? <laughs> you have another family. Even if you don't know your biological family, you have another family. If you are a Christian, you are part of the family of God. You are part of this group of people who are called to follow God together into eternity. You are going to spend eternity with the people sitting around you. You probably should learn to like them now. <laughs> you have millions of spiritual aunts and uncles and cousins all around the world. You are part of the family of God. But family is messy. Family takes your time. Family takes your money. Family disagrees. Family fights, family argues, families can be upsetting, they can be dysfunctional. So it would be fair of you, if you look around this room, to ask, is this worth it? Is the family of God worth it? Josh, I have a really busy schedule. One more family to invest in? One more thing tugging at my time and my resources? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth discipling students? Is it worth sharing the gospel? Is it worth forgiving people who have hurt me? Is it worth loving these people sitting around me who I don't even like? Is the family of God worth it? The biblical answer is an emphatic yes. And we're going to explore that this morning. Today's sermon is simple. It's a two-parter. Uh, I'm going to first reintroduce you to your extended family, the family of God. We're going to talk about how you became part of this family. We're going to talk about how this family lives together, and we're going to talk about why we live this way. Then we're going to talk about you. What's your role in the family of God? You have a beautiful, essential, unique role to play in the family of God, and it's not to just come and watch. We're going to talk about that this morning. This morning, we're going to learn about the family of God from Ephesians, from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, the church in Ephesus was struggling with this family concept. If you've ever skimmed the letter of Ephesians, you know, okay, they were struggling. Gentiles were saying, are Jews really part of the family? Jews were saying, are those Gentiles really part of the family? 
Are, are, am I part of the family? Do I have a role to play? I mean, I'm not a prophet, pastor, apostle, teacher. Do I have any role to play at all as a normal Christian? No such thing, but let's just pretend normal Christian. What's my role in the family? And so we're going to see what Paul said to the Ephesians, how he answered this question, and hopefully learn a little bit more about what it's like for us today to be part of the family of God. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Ephesians 4.1. Ephesians 4.1, as we learn what the family of God is and what our role is in it. Ephesians 4.1, this is Paul speaking. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the earthly lower regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself, the one who ascended, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So how did you become part of the family of God? Well, you'll notice in the first section Paul uses the word calling multiple times. In fact, the word received in my translation is actually also the word calling. So you're worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You've been called to one hope which you've been called. The word calling is throughout this. You have been called by God. That's how you became part of the family of God. What is that calling? That calling goes back to chapters one through three of Ephesians, which if you have time to read it, I encourage you to. Chapters one through three is sort of the adoption process into the family of God. It takes Paul three chapters to describe how amazing it is that God chose you, that he called you to be a Christian, that he saved you, that he redeemed you, that he reconciled you to himself, that he cleansed your past, took away all sin, bore it on this cross, that he saved you, brought you into a new hope, a new family, a new future with him forever and ever. That's how you became part of the family of God. The moment you were saved, the moment you were bought by Christ, the moment you accepted faith in him. You were adopted. So God is no longer this distant deity, but a father. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now in chapter four, Paul urges the Ephesians to live like the family of God, to walk according to this amazing calling. The family of God comprised of every person who has come to know Christ as their savior, and had their lives changed, Paul says, if that's you, here's how you walk. Here's how you live. And I want to pause because I want to note that just like your biological family, you don't live like the family of God to become part of the family of God. You live like the family of God because you already are part of the family of God. That if you accepted Christ as your savior, you've become part of this family by his grace. So Paul calls the, uh, the family in Ephesus to walk which is just an image of, of daily, of, of, of intimate, of walking obedience with humility, gentleness, 
patience, enduring in love, and zealously guarding the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. Who here would like those words to describe their family this Thanksgiving? <laughs> That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be to each other. This, this counter-cultural, this worldly movement of people who, counter-worldly movement of people who love one another. Patiently, humility, endurance in love, gentleness. What a testimony. So how do we live as the family of God? I was, what does this look like practically? I was once leading a small group of teenagers, no easy task. And at the beginning, they were kind of messing around and um, uh, several of them were joking about Democrats. They were, they were making cruel jokes, calling them names, talking about how stupid Democrats, going into this whole thing. And about two minutes in, one of their friends, someone who they've known for four years, raised his hand and said, uh, I'm a Democrat. Silence. And I stayed silent. I let the, the uncomfortableness build. And in that moment, they had a choice. Were they going to choose humility, gentleness, patience? I'm proud to say they did. They chose humility. They chose patience. They chose gentleness. And we had a wonderful hour-long conversation about what unites us and what it means to be the family of God and how we can love one another and what a testimony that is to a watching world that is so divided. the family was preserved. Family is more important than the petty things that divide us. Imagine our witness to the world if all of us consistently chose humility, patience, endurance, guarding our unity over division. Imagine a place where, where Washington football fans and Dallas Cowboy fans. <laughs> that might go too far. Imagine a place where nerds and jocks, where, where engineers and artists, where Americans and Iranians, where, where, where Democrats and Republicans, where everyone can come together, not over the things that divide them, but over what unites them, because they're all desperately in love with Jesus. And that's all that matters to Paul. That's what the church is meant to be. That's what the church is meant to be. So why do we live this way? Family can be annoying. <laughs> They can be upsetting. You just don't, I don't understand how someone could be a Cowboys fan, Josh. Doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Why do we live this way? Why do we live as the family of God? Paul tells us. Paul tells us. Why do we make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace? Why? Because there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope. What hope? The hope of Jesus Christ. When you were called. One Lord, Jesus Christ, one faith, faith in him, one baptism when you were baptized into his family, one God and father of all of us, whether we like them or not, who is over all of us and through all of us and working in all of us. These are our family ties as the family of God. Sometimes I think we take for granted how beautiful the family of God is, how awe-inspiring. I had the privilege once uh, working at VBS here and um, there were these two friends, with, they had brought a guest, and she didn't know the Lord, she was not a Christian, and at the end of the gospel presentation, she wanted to come to know Christ, and so they took her over to this very uncomfortable adult volunteer <laughs> and asked him to explain the gospel, and he did, and she prayed and she accepted Christ. And I'll never forget, because what, what attracted me was not words, what attracted me was the yelling. Both girls took her hands and just started dancing. And they said, we have a new sister. We have a new sister. We are all sisters in Christ. Tears streaming down their cheeks. If you can watch that and not cry, you have a heart of stone. <laughs> I cried. What a beautiful moment. How many times have you cried when you see someone come to know Christ? How many times have you said, oh my God, I have a new brother. I have a new sister in Christ. This is not an old person. This is a new person in Jesus. If we believe the gospel, that is amazing. That is amazing. All right. I get it. Part of the family of God. Understand. But now that I'm part of the family of God, what is my role? Is it to sit in a chair? Because <laughs> I like sitting in chairs, and I do too. <laughs> but what is my role in the family of God? Well, Paul tells us, he moves on in verse 7 to talk about our role in Christ. Your role, according to Paul, is very, very simple. It is to use all of your gifts to build up the body of Christ. Just like your biological family, there is unity in a diversity of gifts. Praise God, I'm glad not everyone is like me in the family of God. Paul reminds the Ephesians that each of them have received gifts from Christ who achieved victory through his death and resurrection. 
Some are apostles, some are pastors, some are evangelists, some are pastors and teachers. And when we read that, I think we're tempted to say, oh, those are the people who are gifted. Those are the people who are supposed to do ministry. But read very, very closely. Are they equipped to do ministry? Are they? They're equipped to equip his people, his saints, for the work of ministry. The pastors, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists are not there to do the ministry. They are there to equip everyone to do the ministry. That is a fundamental change of mind. You have an incredible role in the body of Christ. If you are a saint, you have a ministry. You have a vital role to play. You have an opportunity to touch lives, to reach people in your sphere that we will never reach, that pastors will not reach. You are a minister of the gospel, even if you're an engineer, baker, doctor, teacher, lawyer. Your full-time job is to represent God and call people to him with all of your gifts. Every person has an essential role in the family of God. God does not make mistakes. Paul uses the image of a body. And if you think of a body, we all know that if any part of the body stops working, we're in trouble. You might be the liver of the family of God, but if your liver fails, you die. So please keep being a liver in the family of God. Every role essential, every person important. Why? Because God does not make mistakes. To each, he has given gifts just as Christ apportioned it. And the day Jesus makes a mistake is the day you are no longer essential to the body of Christ. Students have an important role to play in the body of Christ. I remember one Sunday, I was in a small group with students, and, and one student was attempting to share something that was on his heart. His grandma was dying of an illness, and he was trying to share this prayer request, but every time he started, another kid would make a fart noise, and they'd all laugh, and, and he'd try again, and they'd make a fart, and they'd all laugh, right? And, and eventually, he just stopped, and I, and I finally quieted everyone down, and I said, hey, okay, no, no, go ahead, share. And he leaned back in his chair with a sad look on his face. He said, it's okay. They don't care anyway. If those students claim to represent Christ, what do you think that one student thought Christ thought about his prayer request? And it didn't matter how much the pastor leaned in and said, no, no, everyone cares. It's important. Your prayer request is important. When the people of God didn't use their gifts to build him up, he was torn down. They missed an opportunity that morning. They missed an opportunity. On the positive side, uh, there was this female student who I had the, the blessing to know while she was in high school. Um, this female student uh, saw a need. She saw that we were struggling with outreach into Lake Braddock. Uh, if you've ever tried to reach into any public school as a pastor, it is really hard. It's hard to be a teacher in a public school, just to be clear. <laughs> Much less a pastor on the outside. No one wants to come up and talk to the weird guy wandering around school campus, right, with a Bible in his hand. It's really, really hard. So this girl, who was already on the inside, decided to use her gifts, and she became a leader in not one, but three Bible studies, I think two of which she started. And she invited me to come speak in one, and I was like, okay, all right, I'll come talk to the you know, three students who come to this Bible study at 7 a.m.? What? I'm not at work at 7 a.m. <laughs> no way high schoolers are gonna show up to this thing. I show up, there were like 20 students there. <laughs> there to pray, to read the word, to love one another, to use their gifts to build up the body of Christ, and it, there, it was amazing. I can't tell you how many new people I met in youth group who, when I asked them why they were there, they said, oh, so-and-so invited me. I got tired of hearing her name. I was like, stop inviting people. <laughs> You're taking it from all of us. No. It was incredible. What if she had leaned back and gone, you know, I'm not a youth pastor. It's my youth pastor's job to do outreach. It's my youth pastor's job to evangelize. Dozens of people would not have come to know Christ and come to be edified and brought into his community without her using her gifts. She ministered for the gospel. She ministered for the gospel. The elderly have an important role to play in the body of Christ. My life is a continual story of elderly people pouring into me with wisdom. And I can't say who they are now because I've said they're elderly, so I should have thanked them first. But, but it's, a, it's a continual series of elderly people pouring into me with their perspective and their wisdom and their love. I, I, Jeremy and Kim and, and Matt, the student ministry team, if you ask them, they will tell you some of our most effective volunteers are 55 plus because they love the students truly and the students love them and the students benefit from their perspective and their time and their wisdom. 
My life is the best example of this I can think of. Whether you believe it or not, I am up on this stage right now because of you. Every person here who has prayed for me and poured into me and loved me and cared for me, I am a living testimony of the family of God. I am a living testimony of the grace of God working through the family of God. And I promise you that there are so many more people like me who need you. They need you. So use your gifts to build up the family of Christ wherever you are in life. Look at the people around you. I promise there are people who need you to love them, to pray for them, to evangelize them, to use your gifts. Whether your gift is directing cars in the parking lot, which is very essential if you've ever parked here on a Sunday morning. (laughs) or whether your gift is pouring into kids, or whether your gift is forgiving someone at work who no one else will forgive, or whether your gift, what I don't know what your gift is. Maybe you're good at math. I don't understand that. We need you, believe it or not. We need mathematicians. We need everybody in the body of Christ because when we are all using our gifts, Paul tells us exactly what's gonna happen. What's the result if we use our gifts to build up the body of Christ? We grow up together in Christ. Paul says here, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. Anyone who knows Christ wants to be like him, wants to grow like him. And if you're trying to do that by yourself, you will face frustration and failure along every stage of the journey. Because the word Paul uses here is not plural. Until, you know, our whole persons are reaching the mature body. No, we become one mature body in Christ. You need the people around you, even if you don't like them, (laughs) to build you up into the body of Christ. So what's the result? If all of us, Paul says, if every one of you, if every one of us is using our gifts to build up the body of Christ, then we are going to grow. We are going to mature, and we are going to grow into the fullness of him who called us. We're going to become more like Jesus. That's exciting. Have you been trying to become more like him by yourself and feeling frustrated? Embrace the family of God. Use your gifts to build up the family of God and let other people use their gifts to pour into you. It's a remarkable thing. When we are mature, we will not be deceived by tricky people and by craftiness of scheming. If you've ever been deceived, that's not a good word. (laughs) It's not fun. Instead, we are going to practice the truth in love growing up into the body of Christ who is the head. As everyone does their part, the body of Christ grows in love. Love is the key word. Does hate, name calling, division, or slander build up your family and help it become more functional around the Thanksgiving dinner table? (laughs) No. Why would that work for the body of Christ? Why would that work for the family of God? Love builds up the family of God. Love builds up the family of God Who would want to be part of a community that's described in verses 14 and 15? Growing, practicing the truth and love into Christ, becoming more like him. Who wants to be a part of that? That is the family of God. And the most exciting thing about it is it doesn't start with the church staff. It doesn't start with the person sitting next to you. It doesn't start with the missionaries. It it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with all of us using all of our gifts to build up people towards Jesus, to tell people about Jesus, to make people more like Jesus. You have a role to play in the family of God. Become equipped to do the work of ministry. See your life like a field for ministry and ask God how you can serve him. All right, conclusion. It's easy. You are part of the family of God. And your role is to build up the family of God. Simple, but so hard. This week, maybe you need to just sit back and reflect upon the family of God. Maybe this week you need to reflect on the beauty, the the awe-inspiring amazingness that it is to be changed by Jesus. As Pastor Marty talked about last week, all the things Jesus has saved us from, maybe that's something you need to do this week. Just reflect on how your past, your present, your future has changed and how the person sitting near you is also that, is also change, is also made more like Jesus. Uh, How we are unified under one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, whether that person is like you or not, maybe you, you need to reflect on how beautiful that is, that you're part of this extended family that is messy and occasionally dysfunctional, but is bonded together by the common love for Jesus Christ and what he has done in our life. 
Maybe you've been an observer in the family of God. You have the opportunity to start using your gifts for the family of God this week, today. You have a beautiful purpose. You don't miss another minute of it. I encourage you to find a way to serve others using your gifts at work, at home, school, here at church. It could be as simple as a parking team who are not simple. They, what they do is amazing and I have no idea how they do it. <laughs> it could be as simple as forgiving someone who hurt you. It could be as simple as discipling a student who needs discipling. It could be as simple as loving someone younger than you. It could be as simple as taking someone out for coffee and hearing their story. I urge you this week, use your gifts for the body of Christ. And if you don't know what that looks like, talk to the family of God. Come talk to Pastor Michael or Pastor Marty or your small group. I promise all of them would love nothing more than to help you discover what your gifts are and how God is calling you at this moment, not in 10 years, at this moment, to follow him and build up the body of Christ. And no matter where you are, whether you're a dweller or an observer or a doer, I encourage you to lean on God. You'll notice in this passage, it's God who makes all of this possible. Who gave us this unity? The Holy Spirit. Who's God over all of us? Oh, God is. <laughs> who are we growing to be more like? Jesus. Who gave us the gifts? Jesus. God makes this possible. So if you're frustrated, if you're angry with the body of Christ, if you don't understand what's happening, turn to God. Ask him to show you how amazingly beautiful his salvation is. Ask him to help you love the people who are unlovable in the family of God and ask him to help you use your gifts for the body of Christ. Turn to him and I promise he will do it. Rely on God because it is only by his power, by the power of the Holy Spirit that makes this life possible, that makes this amazing unity possible because without Jesus, there's nothing else to bind us to these people. Today, I have been ordained to a certain calling in the body of Christ. But today you have been commissioned to an equally important calling. And I don't know what that is. And that's so exciting because that's for you to discover day by day, living out what Christ has called you to do. You have been called to use your gifts to build up the body of Christ, whatever that looks like. Your calling from God is just as important as mine. I want to close with an ancient creed. This creed is not magic. It's not from the Bible, but what it is, is it's kind of a family mission statement. Anyone have one of those hanging on their wall? I had one hanging on my wall as a kid, right? This is sort of a family ties kind of statement. This is something that shows us what unites us, what has united us for 2000 years with people all around the world who have been saved by Jesus. And so I'm going to invite a little bit of a family bonding activity. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to read along with me. And as we read this statement, I want you to reflect on these amazing things that unite us and bring us together and think about what possibly could break that apart. The answer is nothing, but let's read together. We're going to read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. Can we get it up on the screen? Ah, there we go. Read with me, please. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. <laughs> he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, That's what unites us. That's what brings us together. That is what bonds us into this family that can never be broken. Why? Because it is under the headship of Christ who brings us together. If you read this, you are commissioned to full-time ministry. Might not be paid, <laughs> just crowns in heaven, but you are commissioned to full-time ministry wherever you are. The church I grew up in would close every week with a benediction. It's a commission, and I want to read this to you. And as we close with this, I invite you to use your gifts to serve the body of Christ. So this morning, right now, I invite you to go from this place to love the Lord and love the people, to serve the Lord and serve the people. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>